Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to All About Canadian Books. Today we'll be discussing Under a Kabul Sky, short fiction by Afghan women. Very excited to have translator Elaine Kennedy here with us. She will tell us the story behind the book. And just before we jump into the discussion, um, it's a series of 12 short stories that dive deep into the imaginary worlds where everyday life is marred and marked by war. They speak of wounded love, captured women, confinement, talismans, borders, and wolves. And it is a beautifully written written book and I so enjoyed it. Welcome to All About Canadian Books, Elaine. Thank you. So excited to find out the story behind the book. Are you ready? I am. Okay, so the book was originally published in France in 2019, uh, we went from French into English. Elaine, how did you become involved in this project? Um, well, do you want the short story or the long story? <laughs> Whichever one you would prefer. I love okay. a good story. I'll go back a little bit because okay. it was um, published in French in France, but it was translated from Afghan Persian into French. Mm -hmm. So what happened with this collection, because this is a fairly unique situation is that a publisher in France, Emmanuel Moison of um, Edition de Super High, had a concept about publishing a collection of short stories by Afghan women. And it was complicated for her to approach an Afghan publisher as a woman. So she had to be introduced by a man uh, and um, they found a publisher in Kabul who was very interested in the project. And he went about selecting 60 short stories from a number of different collections and anthologies that had been published in Afghanistan. That was his initial call. And he gave Emmanuel Moisson these 60 stories to choose from. They were all written in Afghan Persian, and so she had her people, uh, including her translator, Kohesta Ibrahimi, read through these stories, and they narrowed it down to these 12. And so the 12 were then translated. They So they were not published as a collection in Persian. They were published in different anthologies. Mm -hmm. uh, then they were public. Then they were translated into French, and published as a collection in France. Wow! Oh. I know that's the backstory. It's incredible. It's it's a really unique story. Um. So when I um. I met the editor in chief at the time, the late Luciana Riccatelli mm -hmm. at the Montreal Book Fair, um, at the Translation Rights Fair at the Montreal Book Fair in 2019. And she approached me about this project. She said, I have this project. I'd like to send it to you. Um, tell me what you think. And I looked at it and I had never seen anything like this before because to translate a translation, is called a relay translation. Mm. And a lot can happen between Afghanistan and at the time Montreal. Yeah. So um, that is how I got involved in the project. Luciana asked me for my thoughts about it and I read it. I thought it was eminently translatable, mm -hmm. but I mentioned to her that I would have questions for people. Um, I felt I mentioned that going through another translator's prism, things will happen um, because I don't have access to the Persian. I don't speak it or read it. I cannot reproduce in English some of the aesthetic elements 
of the Persian, anything to do with sound or rhythm, alliteration uh, and rhyme and so forth. However, you might say that things could be lost, but a lot was to be gained because it meant, of course, you can reproduce a rhythm, um, but you can also reach an audience that would have never been reached otherwise had it not had you not taken a risk of translating it. Wow, I, like I can't imagine what it would have been like just going through that. <laughs> It's incredible. And so were you able to speak with, so the Persian, no, but were you able to speak with the person who did the original translation from Persian to French? We, we didn't uh, have any communication in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so six of the authors, actually five live in Canada and one in the States, and I was unable to communicate with them. I didn't have their email addresses. And it was, as you'll recall, a very complicated time because the Taliban had returned. Mm -hmm. So the question became, do people want to have any visibility? Do they want to even be found? If they are, if you do contact them, could that put anybody, uh, friends, relatives at risk? Uh, anyway, I didn't know any of this, but I wasn't, I had asked for email addresses and I was unable to obtain them. So I had no contact with the authors. You think Things you just, you don't think about, right? The, the ramifications of something would be just entirely massive. Wow. Um, and you kind of talked about this a little bit, if we could dig a little deeper, because it went from Persian to French, French to English. Um, you know, you talked about the rhythm, um, but was it hard to maintain the authentic authenticity of the writer's voice? Like, how, how do you, how do you do that? Um, I had to rely on the internal logic of each story as a guide. Yeah. So, um, you know, what person was it written in? Was it first person and very direct? Was it third person narration? What was the tone of it? Was it a very existential feeling uh, type of tone? Was it very poetic um, and legend feeling? Was it um, like a hallucination? Uh, was it like a grandmother talking directly to you? What was what was the tone of it? Um, what was the register? Was it a poetic register? Was it very colloquial? And so I would look at all of these elements, um, the symbolism, the meta the metaphors, and so forth, and use the internal logic of each story as my guide. And at the very end of the process, of course, there was lots of research to do about Afghan uh, culture, what the landscape looked like, what the houses looked like when they would be talking about courtyards and alleyways uh, and so forth, um, how bread is made in a tandoor oven. What does a tandoor oven look like? Is it fermented bread? How does how do you make the bread? Uh, what do people wear? You know all of these all of these things because it's very visual when you're translating. So I did the research. Um, I used the internal logic as a guide, and at the end of the day, I was able to ask questions of the French publisher. Mm -hmm. The things I really couldn't work out. Yeah. Oh. It's it sounds like an incredible e experience because I know I used to think that it was just taking a word and turning it into, you know, just but it, there's so much more involved. And it sounds like was this project um, did it was it more research than your typical translation that you work on, Elaine? Um, I wouldn't say that it was more research. Mm -hmm. Um 
uh, it, I would say that what was perhaps more unusual about it was I had never translated anything coming out of that culture. Okay. Um, now, often as a translator, you're translating, you know, when you're translating um, an Afro-Canadian author whose characters go back to Africa in their mind, of course, you know, um, there's a lot of research to do there. But this particular culture, I had not done any translation yeah. from before. So, yeah. And what can you what can you tell us? Like you've obviously spent a lot of time with these twelve women. What can you tell us about them? Um, about the women from their stories. It's interesting. Um, as Westerners, we know that we have a lot of freedom here. We have freedom of speech. We have the freedom to go to school, um, to get an education, to have a profession, mm -hmm. to choose our life partner, to decide whether or not and where we want to have a baby. Yeah. We can choose where we want to live and so on and so forth. From these stories, um, what I learned from these women was that it's in that society, women have a very different position. They might not be able to go to school after a certain point, yeah. um, but as a, as a young, very young woman, have to work to earn their keep. Even if they have the advantage of education, they might not never be able to have an occupation. Um, people might not care about what they do. There might be an, an expectation for them to get married and to have children. Uh, they might not be able to choose their life partner. Even if they love a man, um, their partner will be chosen for them. Um, someone they may have never met, someone from another country. Um, they might be very pregnant, but because this is a war-torn country and they have to flee, um, they might be partly in labor as they're fleeing. They might have to give birth among strangers um, and on and on. So these are realities that we are absolutely not accustomed to. And, um, you know, not to mention being, it's war, uh, not to mention being abducted, kidnapped, um, imprisoned, raped, mm -hmm. um, uh, and having no freedom whatsoever, yeah. no prospect of, uh, of a future. So, and What's interesting about all of this is while war permeates these stories, and how could it not, what I found fascinating about it, about them, is how the authors nonetheless wove beauty into this and were able to transcend the horrors of war through various literary devices. Um, and so they brought beauty and light into these stories. And that I found to be just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And that was something that I really appreciated too was, well, the beauty, but also the the terrain and the weather was almost like a character in itself. You know, they talking about the waters flooding and it's it, it's just it's it's incredible um elaine last question what would you like readers to walk away with when with this book when they finish it um certainly we do not hear from afghan women mm -hmm. uh writers uh in north america um, these are voices that need to be re 
heard, um, they are voices that might often be repressed, um, where even if they speak, they might have to say something that is not their opinion. So I think that this is an opportunity for readers to hear about a very different reality, but one that is uncensored. This is women saying what they think in their own words, uh, through two translations. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> no, but in, you know, it, it's an incredible book on March 8th, we've got international women's day coming up. And I just think what a perfect book to, you know, what to celebrate and all of these um, Afghan women's voices. And I really enjoyed reading the book. And I've also really enjoyed speaking with you, Elaine, and just learning more of the story behind it. So Thank you so much for being a guest on All About Canadian Books. My great pleasure, Crystal. Thank you for having me. Loved it. And viewers, thank you so much for watching. That's Elaine Kennedy is my guest, and she is the translator for Under a Kabul Sky. A short, oh, as I'm losing my train of thought here, short fiction by Afghan women. Thank you. Bye.